Hi, everybody. My name is Andy Slinger, and I'm a principal and the leader of our veterinary practice consultants for SVA Certified Public Accountants. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth and final webinar in our Buying and Selling Veterinary Practices series titled Understanding the Sales Process. Now, before we get started, I want to take a second and say a few words about SVA and our history with veterinarians. Like many of you, we got to where we are by being independent, and our vision moving forward is to remain that way and continue serving the same clients we have since 1974. And a huge part of that client base over these last almost 50 years has been within our healthcare practice, which includes medical, dental, and of course, vet practices. Our mindset is that when you're a practice owner or a shareholder, you have to work with someone who's more than just an accountant or a tax preparer. You need someone who is a true trusted advisor working collaboratively with you. This webinar and others like it are just one small way in which we do that. Now we've got a lot of content to go over in the next 30 minutes, but we're, we are going to try to leave a little time at the end for Q&A. So please send in any questions you may have as we go, but we'll wait until the end to answer them. Now it's just not me today. I'm going to be joined by Nate Dracklison. Nate is a senior manager in our healthcare practice, and like me, works with practice owners and practice managers on efficiency, tax strategy, profitability, and of course, buying and selling strategies. Okay, so before we dive in, I just want to kind of, for those of you, some of you have been with us the entire series, some of you a couple, some of you may just be joining us here for the wrap up. But I just want to kind of remind you where we've been and, and kind of where we hope to go today. So back in September, which feels like a long time ago, we started out by basically presenting buying and selling vet practices 101. You know, I'm thinking about it. I'm ready. What do I do? We took a break and we, we launched our first ever uh, salary and benefits survey and just kind of gave you some HR trends and tips came back in November and tried to answer the question with our, with our valuation analysts, what's my practice worth? Okay, the question we get every week, okay? In December, we took it and said, okay, now you know what your practice is worth or how much you need to pay for this practice, now what? How do I maximize what I get? Where do I go from here? How do I get to the point of entertaining offers? And so finally today we wrap up and that's where we are, okay? You're entertaining offers. And it's how do I get from this point to the finish line, as we like to call it, okay? So today agenda is really understanding that in-depth final sales process, okay? And we ended the last session by looking at the letter of intent process. Today, we'll take a deeper dive. And how do you evaluate the letters of intent? How do you narrow them down? If you were on last time, I think I mentioned due diligence about five times and how it happens before, during, and after the letter of intent process and how important that is on both sides for the buyer and the seller. So we'll continue that conversation. Contracts are huge, right? And you know, Nate and I are learning more and more as we're involved in these sales, how important the details and the contracts are. So we're, Nate's gonna take a deeper dive into contracts. Financing used to be so easy. It's one of the easiest parts. Banks were lined up. They're still lined up, but now it's harder because of interest rates that many of us have never seen in our careers. So we got to talk about that. And then last but not least, you know, once everything's lined up, how do you cross the finish line and, and get what you, what you really want? Okay. So as always, we like to know and understand our audience and maybe tailor our presentation a bit to who's joining us. So start with our poll question. And for those of you that have been with us, it's the same poll question to start. Are you looking to buy within the next one to three years? Are you looking to sell within the next one to three years? Are you a seller, but you're not sure exactly when? Or are you a buyer, but you're not sure exactly when that's gonna happen? Pick the one that best describes you. All right, so we have a very good mix here. We have um, definitely a little bit tailored on the sales side, but we do have some, some buyers joining us. So I think this will be very valuable on both sides. So let's go ahead and start with 
really the, the first important document you'll look at once you've gotten through due diligence is the LOI or the letter of intent. So to distinguish, if you are selling to a private equity group or a, a corporate entity, you're likely going to get a formal letter of intent or LOI for short, okay? If you are selling or buying as an associate or to an associate or you know a, a competitor in the area, private sale, it's, it's a term sheet. And regardless, it basically is an outline of all the important factors in this sale, when and when everything is going to happen and how, okay? Question we get right away is, well, how many of these do I obtain, okay? If you're signed to corporate, probably maybe five at the most, okay? Then you're going to whittle that down to two to three, and then eventually you're going to get to the point of sell, signing one, okay? And again, feel free to entertain as many as you want initially, but just know that that's due diligence for all of them and with all of them. And so the sooner you can narrow it down to the ones that are really serious and giving you the best terms, the better for you and quite honestly for them. So you're not wasting their time either. So what does the term sheet or the LOI entail? It's what are you getting and when and how and, in, and what are the components of it? So let me give you an example. Let's say it says that they come to the conclusion that your practice is worth 1.2 million. Just a nice number. They're going to offer you eight hundred thousand in cash, two hundred thousand as an equity piece, and then two hundred thousand in future incentives. I'll tell you right now, if I was evaluating that, I tell you, you can count on the eight hundred thousand, and that's it. The incentives, as we'll explain, might be worth zero. The equity might be worth zero. Okay, so the point: focus in and narrow in on the cash. Okay. Some of it may be paid now, some of it may be paid in the future, but again, it will outline what you're getting and when you're getting it. It will include what's included in this sale, what's not, okay? Some of the components of the practice may be retained personally for whatever reason. If you're gonna retain the real estate, some may be allocated to the real estate. And again, you're gonna hold on to that. That's not gonna be sold. So again, Nate will go into that a bit on some best practices and some things to be aware of. Contingencies, okay? Right now, the word you hear is EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, okay? What they basically do, and those of you that were in the valuation, you, you understand more about EBITDA. What they basically do is they right-size your overhead and they figure out, okay, what's the one-year return on investment? What's the one-year profit in this practice? Well, if you think about it, that's the bottom line on the financial statement. Think of all the things that can go wrong to get to that bottom line. So beware of the EBITDA threshold. In our opinion, that's a challenging number to really control as the now non-owner and as the potential associate in that practice for a time. Think about revenue. On the other hand, that's the top line on the income statement, right? A lot of things can go wrong after that, but the revenue might still be strong. So again, much better benchmark much better goal to potentially have some control on, especially if it's been trending solid for many years, predictable. And remember, corporate entity buys you, more than likely they're gonna raise fees, okay? Which will likely increase revenue. So just keep those in mind, revenue better than EBITDA threshold. Equity, whatever equity is, it means that a portion of the sale, you're buying stock. You're investing in this new company that you're selling to. Okay, maybe they don't have enough cash or they want you to have some skin in the game. Be cautious. It's like buying any other stock, right? You, you invest $100,000, someday that could be worth $200,000 or more. Or like happens in the real world, it could be worth zero. So just know, as long as you're willing for that to be zero, that's fine. Now we hear all the time, hey, some of it's got to be an equity. And if I'm going to invest money, I don't know where else to do it right now. The stock market's so volatile, I might as well put it in a vet practice. I know a vet practice. I understand it. I trust a vet practice. It's a good place to put my money. And I'm going to be working there. Okay. Both of those sound good. So again, just know it's not guaranteed. The LOI will outline your employment agreement, because as we've told you, more than likely you will work in that practice for a time. So how long, what are the terms? How are you compensated? What are your benefits? What responsibilities do you have? Make sure that's very clear. The real estate, Almost all of these, you're not selling the real estate. You're retaining the real estate. Make sure your rent is fair market value before, because 
you should be getting fair market value after. Why should that change? Make sure you have an out. Make sure you have a good lease. Make sure you're not left. Again, worst case scenario, you're left with an empty building that no one wants. Make sure that's not going to happen. The key here, it's non-binding. This is not a contract. It's non-binding. There's going to be a lot of due diligence. If it's something happens and you just realize this is, was not a good idea, you can walk away. In most cases, they also can walk away. So this is non-binding. At the same time, it's exclusive. So once you sign one, okay, what they don't want is they don't want the last minute the rugs pulled out from underneath them because on the side, you were entertaining other offers. You were negotiating behind the scenes and all of a sudden you got a better offer and you walk away. No, that wouldn't work either. So it's exclusive. Both parties are serious. I can't stress it enough. Ask for references, right? Ask to talk to an owner who has sold to that company at some point in the past. Okay, it's the best you can do. And obviously the longer you can get from when the sale happened, the better, because you can find out, hey, did this, these incentives, did they work out? Your equity, is it looking like you're actually gonna get something for that equity? Okay, so references, the longer out from sale, the better. And just remember, due diligence, they're gonna look at your practice inside and out, all your documents, everything about your practice, past, present, and, and looking into the future happens before, happens during, happens between now and signing those contracts and closing. So just be ready and expect the due diligence process to happen. Okay, so let's say you've entertained the offers, you've whittled them down to two or three, and you know what? We're good. We're ready to sign the term sheet or the LOI. We have the buyer, the seller, we're matched. Now what? So at this point, Nate will do a deeper dive into what comes next. Thanks, Andy. You know, with, with any time you're looking at a contract type situation, including an LOI, there's always a lot of different tentacles involved. And of course, it's important to have a good handle on those and be comfortable with them. Everything from what does it mean for me post-sale? Am, am I staying on as an employee? Uh, what does that time horizon look like? Are there going to be a non-compete agreement as there usually is? What does that term and radius look like? What is actually being purchased? Are they purchasing typically equipment, existing inventory, maybe the real estate if you're selling the building as well? Maybe one of the trickier ones is are any leasehold improvements you've done on the building and who paid for those? If the clinic paid for them, they probably should be included as well. Make sure that you understand the timing of when you're going to be receiving the cash part of the sale and the equity part of the sale, if there is some. Is it all going to be right away? Is there going to be some period of holdback of some of those funds to help evaluate expenses that happen after the sale and determine who covers those? Is there going to be an opportunity for negotiating the letter of intent and the terms therein? Are there some favorable items that you really like and maybe some aspects that you don't like that you want to talk to the buyer about? Again, you want this to be a collaborative process. And then lastly, a very important part of the sale is going to be the actual tax allocation. How is the purchase price allocated to the various items being purchased, which we're actually going to spend a little bit more time on here in just a second. So throughout the deals that we've been a part of, there's really a few best practices and, and just a general understanding that you'll want to have as you think about what an allocation might mean for you. Typically, in, as a part of every sale, something is being purchased that is very tangible. The equipment, the inventory, existing supplies. Those types of items tend to at least have an ordinary aspect in nature or be considered fully ordinary income, meaning that they're taxed to you at normal tax rates. Then usually there's a less tangible component called goodwill, maybe some of the non-compete, uh, maybe purchasing the clinic name, there might be a assigned value to that. Those items tend to be capital in nature and tend to have a longer time horizon. So on the seller side of things, you typically want the bulk of the purchase price to go toward the capital section of, of taxation. And from the buyer side, they typically want more of the allocation to be on the ordinary side toward the physical items, because then going forward, they get to duck, deduct those items for tax purposes at a faster rate than they do with things like Goodwill. So it's really important to understand that there's gonna be possibly this push and pull. Again, you wanna keep things amicable and have a good discussion about it, but both sides are kind of incentivized to do different things. 
The other best practice that we typically recommend, and it's also something you want to avoid if you can, is sometimes there are aspects of deals that are deferred into the future, into future years. That typically tends to revolve around equity, but it could revolve around cash as well. If you're going to be purchased by typically a corporate entity, sometimes as part of the sale price, they will award equity. And that equity may get, have value right now. It may not have value until sometime in the future. But typically, income from those items is recognized as it's gained. So some of that may go into the future. Now, what we like to avoid is pushing some of those ordinary items like inventory and receivables and equipment into future years. Now you might say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It'd be great to have some of that income taxed at higher rates pushed into future years. The only issue with that is that in future years, there's going to be typically an allocation of income from the buyer back to the seller of the clinic to make up for some of those differences. And that volatility is typically not very favorable. So something to keep in mind as, as you look forward and also work with your advisors into the future about what the tax allocation means for you. So leading up to the actual closing of the deal and um, also post-closing, you're gonna, gonna get, you're gonna wanna get a handle on what expenses you have left as part of winding down your business or transitioning your business. You wanna talk about this in advance with the buyer. Who's going to be in charge of keeping track of some of these records? How are things going to actually flow? Are you going to keep continuing to pay for them and just keep record of them? Obviously, keeping good records here is gonna be crucial to help justify and track all this stuff over a period of time. Make sure that you have a plan. Are you gonna be collaborating closely with the buyer? Is it going to be a little bit more business as usual and you're going to have your current staff continue to shoulder most of these duties or does some of this go to the buyer's staff? But ultimately you wanna be clear on expectations and duties because uh, there's lots of moving pieces here. You certainly don't want anything to fall through the cracks such as payroll deposits, tax, filings, um, payroll itself, um, you know, irritating vendors because of, of late payments and late fees. All of that stuff still continues even though the sales happen. So you definitely want to make sure that you're in close discussions with them and you have a plan going forward. So as part of developing that plan, you're often going to have to start communicating this potential change to different parties around your practice. Non-owner DVMs, practice manager, staff, your vendors, eventually the general public. The order of this communication tends to look very different for individual practices. From a practical standpoint, the two that typically happen first are the non-owner DVMs and the practice manager. You know, as part of this ongoing process, you're probably going to have to work pretty closely with your practice manager to provide reports to the buyer. Um, continuing to maintain financial records at an adequate level. And at the same time, your non-owner DVMs are likely going to be asked to sign contracts with the buyer going forward to continue the, the business as it is. So you definitely want to bring them in so that they are not surprised when, when they hear the news maybe from somebody else. The big thing is you want to control the narrative. You want to get ahead of it. There's nothing worse than trying to communicate the change after the change has already been communicated to your employees and your staff. Uh, to, nobody, uh, typically uh, people don't like change, but by getting ahead of it a little bit, hopefully you can ease that burden a little bit. So as a part of this process, you're gonna want to work with your financial advisor, your tax advisor, your attorney at the right time to make sure you're understanding the legalities of all of this. What does this mean for you going forward from a financial aspect? And what is this going to mean for you at a, at a tax level, both this year and then into future years? What are you gonna do with the cash proceeds? Do you have specific things you'd like to invest in? What kind of lifestyle do you desire if you're getting toward retirement? Who of your advisors is actually going to be doing specific tasks? Is your tax advisor going to continue that relationship with you and plan for future years and, and when to bring them into that process? And also just the synergy between your tax advisor and your financial advisor to figure out, okay, what can I invest now versus what should I hang on to for my tax burden 
this year and then into future years and keep it in a somewhat liquid uh, investment. The big thing is to come up a plan with a plan with all of your different advisors and make sure that you see it through to get to the finish line for your own peace of mind and then also for the best outcomes. So as a part of this process, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the financing aspect of these deals. Typically, by and large, most are financed by commercial banks. And as part of that process, if that's the route you'd like to go, you're gonna to want to evaluate at least two proposals. And with those proposals, you're gonna to wanna to understand all the different terms. You're going to want to understand any prepayment penalties that might exist. Um, and with the higher interest rate environment we're seeing right now, it certainly brings the opportunity, possibility for seller financing. Typically in a seller financing situation, the sales price is paid off over time, typically at a lower rate than, than could be offered from a commercial lending institution. But the benefits of that is that it gets a guaranteed rate of return, typically pretty guaranteed rate of return for the seller. And that might be something attractive depending on your overall financial situation. Of course, you are gonna to wanna to talk about that with your financial advisor as there could be some risk with that, additional risk to the seller as part of one of those deals. And if the real estate is going with as part of the deal, you could also consider land contracts as, as an aspect of the sale. So as we get toward the actual close and post-close, so getting to the finish line, you're gonna to wanna to get the seal of approval from all of your advisors before you sign the documents. That includes your tax advisor, your attorney, your financial advisor get a good sense of what these mean for you operationally, what they mean for you from a, a personal finance perspective, get the peace of mind that to know that your practice is in good hands and that you are in good hands. You're gonna to wanna to understand some of the incentives and possibly earn outs if they're part of the deal and what that means for you, what those targets might be into the future and as, as what those really are worth. You know, Sometimes those items are, are really, really high level bars and really evaluate, do, you th do I think this is realistic for my practice to, to accomplish to possibly meet and receive this additional compensation in the future? Or should I plan on not receiving those items? And then if, if we make those benchmarks, then, then great. Also understand what your equity investment means. Sometimes that investment might be a great place to, to have your money versus any other investment medium. But at the same side, maybe that, in, that equity might be worth zero someday. So something to talk about with your financial advisor because every company structures their equity situation a little bit different as we see in, in most of the deals that we've been a part of. And then lastly, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you understand your employment agreement, especially the compensation piece. What is actually built into that compensation? What are they asking you to do? Are you going to be taking on more of a managerial role in the clinic than maybe you have in the past? Are they asking for your services beyond your clinic and possibly be an advisor to some of the other clinics in their network? So getting a handle on the time commitment for you and whether it's something you desire is gonna be important. So for final thoughts, I'll send it back over to Andy. Thanks, Nate. The only thing I'll add before I get to my final thoughts on this is, you know, once, once you're after close in those items that Nate just presented, it's up to you. No one's going to be looking out for you, you know, to, to make sure that your, your compensation agreement is, is followed or the incentives or, or whatever those are. So really, it's up to you to make sure that whatever you were promised and whatever achievables, you're the one that has to uh, make sure that, that you're made whole. So final thoughts, and it's challenging because there's been so much information over today and the entire series, but I want to leave you with three thoughts. Number one, we can't say it enough, maximize the cash portion of that sale. And remember, after tax, because it's not just what you're getting in cash, it's after the dust settles and you pay the tax, federal and state, what am I left with? You want to maximize that along with the achievable incentives, preferably revenue, okay, in our opinion. Then if you're, at, if you're at peace with those portions, then okay, the equity, any other incentives, you can see them as your wild card. 
no matter what, you're satisfied. You're probably only gonna do this once. I'll say that again, but you're satisfied, maximize the cash after tax. Number two, we've said this in the beginning, I told you to assemble your team of experts. Well, now this is where you rely on them. Okay, these are your trusted advisors. And this is not a self-serving comment because this is your bankers, this is your attorneys, this is your consultants, these are your tax and your financial advisors, okay? And yes, all expensive, but these are the people that you trust. And so make sure that in their lane, they sign off on the various components of the sale from their expertise, okay? And again, you're gonna do this once, you wanna do it right. And you've had a plan and, and, and you, you're gonna follow through and you're gonna have their seal of approval on everything. And, and that takes me right to my last comment, okay? Is all along, have a plan, do this right. Especially now if we tailor it to today, before closing and, and right after, okay? Make sure that you follow through on that plan. Make sure everybody knows their roles and responsibilities. I can't stress enough how much communication is really key between buyer and seller and everybody involved in your operation, okay? So we tried. We really did try to leave time for questions, and there were a couple questions that came through um, the chat box, but we will go ahead and in the interest of time and to respect everybody else's time, we'll go ahead and reach out to you individually on, on the questions you have. So at this point, I'm gonna to start to wrap this up, but please, before you go, I just wanna thank you, uh, those of you that have attended one or all of our webinars in this series. And this is usually where we would mention future webinars we have coming up, but we don't actually have any more currently scheduled. However, you, you can help us. To help us plan, we're going to be writing articles uh, here in, in early 2023, and then we're going to be putting on a fresh series of webinars uh, in, into the fall and then next winter. So we'd like to ask you one final poll question um, to really get us thinking about that. And so you can check in this case as many as, as applied to you, but operational best practices to improve, simplify your bookkeeping, save you time. Many of you do your own bookkeeping, okay? So... How do we save you some time, make it simpler? Key performance indicators for your practice. How do you compare? Benchmarking, what do your financial statements look like? How do I compare to my peers? How do I make more money? And then last but not least, how do I grow? I've been kind of, I feel a little plateau here. How do I grow? How do I also reduce the amount of income taxes that I'm paying? Okay, so again, as many as apply to you, as many as you would like to hear from us about. Oh boy. Okay. Um, I suppose if there was a all of the above button, I think uh, that, that would have been applicable here. So very good. We will we will take this into consideration um, for the, the materials that we publish. And feel free to also reach out to us with any additional topics that you would like us to consider. That certainly is not an all-inclusive list. You're the one dealing with your own unique situation. And as you've always heard, you might have a question that more than likely applies to a lot of different people. In addition, if there's breaking news or if there's important tax changes or legislation that comes out that might affect your business, we will, as always, pull something together. For now, you can go to svaaccountants.com to sign up for our tax alerts and biz tips. And there are a lot of other resources there to help you as well. Last but not least, we'd like to remind you that the SVA team is only a phone call or an email away. So if you're a client, reach out to your SVA professional as questions come up. If you're currently not an SVA client, you can contact me, you can contact Nate or anyone in our business development group so we can get you the help or the answers you need. Again, thank you for attending today. Happy New Year. Bye.